Welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott, and we're talking about everyone's favorite thing, cryptocurrency and non-fungible tokens or NFTs. And we are joined by Todd Weissel, CEO of Bacchus. So Todd, thanks for joining the Bourbon Lens. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, excited to, to connect. I know last week we were going to get together and some things didn't work out. And so glad to have you on tonight as we uh, talk a little bit about NFTs. Scott, so you you have a son that does trading cards. You know, how do you feel about digital trading cards? Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, he he does collect Pokemon cards, but I guess digitize digitizing trading cards just doesn't seem as fun for kids. But then again, most people that collect Pokemon cards aren't kids. Mm, that's and, true. And uh, the kids are the ones that are putting them in their bike spokes and things like that, tearing the hell out of them. And <laughs> parents are probably losing their minds over it too. Yeah. So speaking of of trading cards and just like, you know, the ability to hold something tangible in your hand because we've moved to a digital space, you know, Todd, did you collect anything growing up um, that would, you know, think of something that has now gone digital through NFTs? Yeah. So I was a, I was a big, um, I wouldn't say Pokemon collector. I used to just actually play the game with my friends. Um, but I guess, you know, after a while you become a collector because you just end up building up so many. So Pokemon, basketball cards, baseball cards, Magic the Gathering, like pretty much card games. I love them. I love playing them. I love collecting them, sticking them on my bike spokes to make it sound like a motorcycle. You name it. We were, we were doing it. <laughs> uh, throwing them against the wall and damaging the corners so that they had no value by the time we were done. Yep. We, we did it all. Yeah. The doll. Yeah. No, man, all my Pokemon cards got stolen in fourth grade. Rough time. Literally like the the week before they're like, don't bring your Pokemon cards to school. And then I brought them to school like a big dummy. And uh, there went my Charizard just out the window. It was rough, rough times. Yeah. My, uh, my parents moved when I was already out of the house, you know, post, uh, post high school. And they have, everything that we've ever every toy we've ever had but somehow my box of magic cards seemingly didn't make it in the move yeah um damn so, so, yeah so uh th- thankfully my siblings have uh, restarted that collection it's uh, it's a running joke in the family they buy me a pack every time they see me <laughs> oh that's hilarious yeah i think the other the other big loss is my dad had a mickey mantle card that just magically disappeared and it was one of like so there was two uh, Mickey Mantle cards that were super rare and he had one of the the lesser rare of the two and it was we we categorized it we did everything but get it graded which we should have done uh, and then it just disappeared and then we had a Chipper Jones rookie card Desert Storm and that that got lost somehow too and, and, and these were in moves so I understand the want and appeal of digitization because by damn we wouldn't have lost some things that are super valuable um, because people pay a lot of money for a Chipper Jones Desert Storm rookie card or a Mickey Mantle, whether it's the rarest or the less rare of the two that would go for quite a bit of money these days. Yeah, I think the uh, the more rare just went for like 12 million plus that like super rare one. So yeah, I, uh, yeah, I know the feeling. One of my cards that I know for a fact I had went for like tens of thousands of dollars and it is... Hopefully, uh, all I'm hoping is that at least someone is playing with it still, that it didn't like get thrown out. That's really all I'm hoping for. That they didn't just end up in a, you know, in a trash dump like, uh, you know, that guy who had a USB stick with like a couple of thousand Bitcoin on it sitting somewhere in a garbage dump. Oh, God. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of that, like, you know, cryptocurrency is something that is convoluted and a lot of people don't even understand you know what you have to do. So I'm going to, I'm going to play like I know what to do. And then you tell me how right or wrong I am. Cause I own a little bit of cryptocurrency and I've lost money doing it. So, uh, an individual would download an app like Coinbase. And, uh, once they have said app or Robinhood, they would then, um, uh, purchase just like a stock. They would purchase a cryptocurrency, um, which, you know, Bitcoin being the most popular or link chain or Ethereum, Ethereum has been the wallet of choice, right? When you look at a lot of cryptocurrency and digital transactions. So if you want to buy some Ethereum, you buy that. And then you have to have a wallet to convert that Ethereum into tangible, um, you know, cash transactions. Uh, And once you have that, then you can purchase things like on open seas, like NFTs. So did I do a decent job explaining that? Yeah, that was pretty good. 
That was pretty good. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I believe that you own cryptocurrency because anyone who claims that, oh, yeah, I've only made money is a liar. They, <laughs> they haven't bought crypto. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's that's a pretty that's that's pretty solid. The um, the two things that I that you know are just for emphasis is that Coinbase, um, you know, is an exchange. So mm-hmm. when we think about the exchanges and people always, you know, there's a toke, there's a phrase like, not your keys, not your wallet, or not your keys, not your tokens. So the difference, like, and you pointed this out, the difference between an exchange where you can buy cryptocurrencies or sell them and a wallet, um, the difference between those is that in a is a wallet, um, assuming you have a good one that only you have the private key to and only the password, that's yours. That's like having, you know, $100 in your pocket. It's on you and you can spend it and, you know, you can verify that you have it. Um, an exchange works a little bit more like a non-FDIC insured bank in the sense of if the exchange goes belly up, any money that you have on that exchange could potentially be lost. It you know, technically belongs to the exchange depending on the terms of service. And that's kind of one of the big things that's going on now with the whole uh, FTX situation is whether or not people, you know, people actually own the tokens that are on there or whether or not they belong to FTX. Mm. That's super interesting because the regulation of crypto is very unregulated, right? Yep. Um, so that that's super interesting. And then, you know, I guess another thing, just for the basis of what is cryptocurrency, can you give us the layman terms of like what makes cryptocurrency cryptocurrency? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So it's a little difficult because there are different types of cryptocurrencies. So, for example, um, Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is what I will call a crypto commodity. Um, the the code that was written dictates exactly how much Bitcoin will ever be released into the world. So you know that there's a finite supply. Um, and it basically is just a public ledger. So a, um, you know, a public account that anyone can view that shows how much of this thing anyone ha- owns. That's really what Bitcoin is built for. So if you own five of them in a wallet, I can click on, you know, the wallet link on one of these explorers, and I can see that there are five Bitcoin in this wallet. I, you know, I don't know that it belongs to you unless you, you know, show me, but I know that it's there. And that's, and that's really just a public ledger of transparency where like, you can actually see how much is out there and see what's, you know, what people actually own. Um, There are other types, um, altcoins, you know, meme coins like Doge and other things. Those are kind of I mean, they're like memes. It's basically a way for people to buy and sell memes effectively, and you know, just to see how much how much money people are willing to pour into it. They don't they don't really have an application or a use case. Um, but then there are specific cryptocurrencies you mentioned, it's like ETH on Ethereum and Sol on Solana. Those tokens work a little differently, um, and those tokens are really designed to pay for the fees on those blockchains. So those are most, you know, most similar to actually almost like a nation state, like a fiat currency in the regards that if you want to buy goods on Solana, you need to pay in Solana's native token. If you want to buy goods on Ethereum, you need to pay in Ethereum's native token. Um, so that's really more of the, you know, when people ask me, like, how do you look at different cryptocurrencies? I, I always tell them, like, do I think the blockchain that they are do I think that the blockchain that the token is on, do I think that it provides value? Do I think that there are things on that chain that people will want to buy? Um, you know, it's not the same, but think about it almost like a Starbucks gift card. You know, if Starbucks says you can buy, you know, 100 Starbucks points and and you're like, okay, great, because people are buying coffee, you know, and then <laughs> they say, and, you know, and I, I know that that has value. I can trade these points for something that I know has value that I'll want. Um and and so you buy them and then you can, you know, let's say you can trade them later because the amount of points needed to get a coffee goes up or the amount of dollars per point goes up. You can always trade that. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily go and buy those points on a for a company that says they're going to open an international coffee chain that's going to rival Starbucks because it's like, well, I, you know, rather rather buy the coffee, you know, the, the, the points that I know I can redeem for coffee versus the ones that maybe one day you'll actually build this giant international, you know, with a uh, coffee brand. Mm. No. So, so that's why a lot of these, uh, loyalty cards and point systems, they're all non-transferable because they didn't want to create this type of marketplace, this secondary market for points. Yeah, exactly. Sky it's miles. like uh, like airline points, exactly. Yeah. Um, which which I could see in the future actually happening. It could it could happen. Um, we'll see. 
but if anybody actually wants to fly on an airplane anymore, but sign that's me up. A whole separate thing. Sign, <laughs> sign me up. I'll I'll still fly. I have no issues. It was great. Delta all the way, baby. Um, but let me tell you, LGA is not a place you want to stop and eat at because woof boy, for some chicken wings and a soda, it was twenty seven dollars. Yeah, that's uh, that's a whole separate whole separate thing on how they, they have you hostage in the airports yeah. and they will charge Captain you whatever Rogers. they want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, so so to keep this moving, so uh, you know, as you you know saw this movement, right? You saw blockchain and you saw cryptocurrencies becoming something. Um, then this evolution of non fungible tokens or NFTs became a reality, right? Um, and so again, let's let's start again with the basis what is a non-fungible token? Like what, what can I now get, um, you know, with these things and what, what are some popular NFTs that people might know? Sure. Sure. So I'll, I'll start with, cause again, this is also a different use case. So at Baxis, um, we do it a little differently, but I'll give you the general sense of how, you know, NFTs work. An NFT is really nothing more than a designated piece of memory on one of these public blockchains that with the, uh, with the, fungibility set to zero, to point zero, meaning that there is only one of these things. And that's what makes it non-fungible. It's this specific space. You can't split. It's not like a if I have one Dogecoin, I can send you 0.5 Dogecoin. But if I have one NFT, I can't send you 0.5 of that NFT. It's, it's non-fungible. It is just one. But it's uh, the way that we think of NFTs, the common person, you know, the Board Ape Yacht Club, um, I think is probably one of the most popular ones that people know. Um, Party Horses, if anyone, you know, listeners to the podcast will, will recognize. Um, what are some of the other ones? Uh, Lazy Lions, Pudgy Penguins, you know, I mean, most of these are effectively cartoons. Um, they're like a collectible trading card. Um, and and what that NFT represents is just that image is saved to, the, to that space and memory on the public ledger is that image. And then wherever that token, whichever wallet it rests in, that is the person who is the you know owner or possessor of that token. So that's really what it reveals to you is on a public ledger that anyone can access and view who owns this picture. That's the way that most people think about uh, common NFTs. Um, and they'd be right. That's the way that most, that's the way that NFTs really blew up. You know, the crypto punks, I think were some of the earliest. Um, and the idea was basically, I can get this digital collectible um, that is that I can prove I own, that I can sell and trade for anyone else digitally, um, and it is stored on one of these blockchains. So yeah, so that's that's the traditional you know way that people view NFTs. The way that we start really were thinking about NFTs at Baxis was, well, this is still a public ledger. So now all we need to be storing instead of it being photos or digital renderings is like I said before, valuable goods that people will want to transact on. We want to use this ledger as a more of a way to keep track of who's buying what and who's selling what and who owns what, instead of it being a place to just trade, you know, pictures and cartoons. So, um, yeah, so I would say definitely we, we think about it, you know, at Baxis uh, differently than the way that people have been using them. So it's something that I think I've started to see that certain like how like uh, titles for homes, for example. Um, there are now, you know, uh, counties that are looking at putting titles on chain. And what that means is now, instead of having to go every single time through the title insurance process and vetting out what's actually going on behind the scenes and, you know, city hall and title insurance, you'll actually be able to see the chain of ownership, the provenance and everything on those titles in a digital way. So um, that's really, you know, at Baxis, that's what we're doing is we're using NFTs and blockchain as a way to prove ownership over, you know, real bottles and barrels of wine and spirits. So I was going to say something about it. I don't want to jump out of, out of line, but I guess it's, it's great for those situations where like we have the secondary market and somebody's like, Oh yeah, I'm going to buy this bottle and I'm buying it from George Smith down the road. And I don't really know George Smith, but somebody else knows George Smith. And they said he was a good guy and they went to his church once. And, uh, but then come to find out this bottle is a fraud, right? It's a refilled bottle or it doesn't exist at all. And there's a, a payment made and a box is shipped and, you know, there's no bottle that ever shows up. So that's, that's one way to go around the, oh my God, I'm spending a thousand dollars on a bottle of whiskey, but 
not knowing yeah. what I'm really going to get. Well, I th- that's that's a great point. And I think if if more people knew how much of whiskey buying was done on a, well, this guy is friends with someone I know on Facebook, so I'm going to send him a thousand dollars and hope that in a week and a half that bottle shows up, they'd be shot. Like there's there's almost no other industry in the world that 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 really, you know, really functions like that, especially because especially for a lot of them, even, you know, the trading card markets, there have been intermediary markets in between you know the 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 PSAs do the authentication and you have eBay for the trading or or StockX you know for for sneakers and other types of goods so the bigger issue has been is is there's you know global demand for whiskey and for these bottles on secondary but there's no one really building um you know no one up up until and that's really what Baxis is solving no one's really built that you know standardized marketplace where you know that the bottle is authentic um you know your George, George down the street he might not be trying to dupe you. He might not have known that he bought a refill bottle from someone else. It's not that he's trying to, you know, sell you a fraudulent bottle. He just doesn't know any better. So when the bottles actually come into to our vault for authentication, each of them actually goes through the authentication process. So once something is minted into an NFT on our on our platform, you know that that is an authentic bottle that exists, you know, 100% inside one of our vaults. Mm. I mean, if you're buying a bottle of whiskey, especially an old one, a rare one, you know, the, the quality and the condition matters, right? Mm. Like, you know, you're not going to buy one if the foil is ripped or if the label is torn or faded. So rather than using cartoons or 3D digital renderings, it takes more time, but it's a part of the authentication process. We actually scan each of the bottles in super, super high resolution. So when you're clicking on a Baxis NFT inside of one of those things, it's actually a full 360 degree video that shows you that you can zoom in onto the finest, most precise details and actually see what's going on on the bottle um, instead of having to you know, rely on, e- even from a regular liquor store site where it's kind of just, uh, hey, here's our, um, you know, here's a stock photo um, and hopefully it matches up with the right release. Yeah, I, I think this is where, where I want to get. So now that we're, we're talking about your all's, you know, chain of activity, right? So uh, I want to talk through like the seller process and the buyer process. So the seller, if I, if I, you know, have this correct, will I have a George T stag 2017 and I want to send that to you all to authenticate it, that it is, it is what it is. You all will then take that and then you'll put it in your locker. I will not have that in my possession at that point in time. It sits in a, in a vault for, for, uh, lack of a better term, just like gold would or whatever back in the dollar. And then anyone, as they peruse, they could say, Hey, this person has set their GTS 2017 at this price. And if I want to do that, then I could buy that token. Now at that point, they could either trade it or collect it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it, yeah, it can go cool. on and on at that point. So some, some people could use it as a digital investment platform. Some people could use it as a opportunity to buy rare whiskeys to then consume it on their end. Correct. And and, and that's a really important distinction also. Um, we're whiskey lovers. Myself, the, the, our team, um, even the members of the team who weren't as into it when they joined, they've gained an appreciation, even if not for the, you know, the drinks and the spirits, but for all of the craftsmanship that goes into it you know we get a chance to introduce them to master distillers and to brand managers and to members of these you know distilleries and companies and they they fall in love and that's that's really a big thing um you know about Baxis is that it's not just about the you know the investment in the trading side we know that there are plenty of people who are doing that but ultimately you know the idea is that one day whether it's now or in a hundred years from now somebody's going to want to sit down with a loved one and crack open a bottle and you want to know that it's real you want to and and beyond that you want to know the story and everything that went along with it where was this bottle when was it you know made where did it go um you know how was it stored uh you know so on december 5th to celebrate the uh, repeal of prohibition i actually brought in a um an ams an american medicinal spirits for my team cracked it open one of the 1917 1932s um, cracked it open for the team, poured out, you know, for everyone and just gave them, you know, a little history lesson in a bottle. Like, Hey, this is what was going on at the time. You know, this was sold for medicinal uses only. And I wish, I wish I had more information about that bottle and on its backstory and all of the, you know, who owned it, where, what, where was it purchased? What, what pharmacy, you know, sold it to the guy, but all that's gone. And and we're never going to be able to find that. So we're, we're hoping to be able to, you know, build more of that for, for going forward so that people mm. who really appreciate this stuff, both the the art, the science, and ultimately the flavor, um, they have a chance to really enjoy more of it. Yeah. 
No, I think that's that's super interesting. And and you you said something and as we, we sit here, I I you know, you got you gotta learn more about your your people as you as you talk to them. So you, you didn't just like come up with this idea overnight. You actually um at one point were the the head of old and rare bottles at a brokerage. So, you know, we didn't mention this, but you know, from from your perspective, Todd, like what was your reason to fall in love with the brown the brown liquid yeah so i have um yeah it's a fun i don't do you guys know the single cast nation joshua hatton and jason so uh i know a single jason cast nation but i don't know the the guys okay got I don't it know if you do got it so joshua and jason they're um phenomenal they run an independent bottler um and they were buddies uh you know blog both whiskey bloggers who kind of had this idea of hey what if you know and this was way back when before it was cool you know what if we bought a barrel and bottled it ourselves and sold it and they did it and sold it to a bunch of friends and they had a tremendous amount of success and uh and they said okay what if we did it again and again and it basically kept kept, kept growing into what's now single cast nation so they um i served for a couple of years in the uh in the idf and the israeli defense forces and when I came back to New York after my service, um, one of my good friends from growing up was like, hey, I've been, you know, volunteering at this whiskey event, you know, for for years. They need some big guys, you know, help out, move things around, you know, or would you be interested? And I'm like, sure. You know, I don't I really I, I said to them, like, I don't know much about whiskey, but why not? And I'm, you know, 21, 22 years old, had never had the opportunity to drink anything that was particularly good. Um but, you know, but still, it, it, I was intrigued and, you know, it was a nice paying, it was a paying job and I got to see a friend. So we got there and and I must say again, like Joshua and Jason are just the kindest, really just the nicest people. And, um, and so they, there was food at the event, you know, it was called the Whiskey Jubilee. It was like a, a kosher whiskey festival, um, kosher food. So while we're there, um, you know, helping, we help get everything set up. We noticed that, you know, the vendors, the actual people who are the brand ambassadors, the representatives, there were like a hundred something of them are standing behind their tables um, you know, giving their pitches over and over, but they, you know, can't go take a break to get food. So we said, you know what, we're done setting up. We're not, let's go like, you know, bring them food. So we went around the rooms, brought them food. I got a chance to hear some of the different descriptions and the marketing. And, and at first I, you know, in my head at that point, I was like, this is all the same. This is all just marketing. This is all. And, um, and, and that's what I assumed. They really knew nothing. But at the end of the night, the, um, the ambassadors were so thankful that we had, you know, brought them food and helped out that they ended up tipping the staff with all of the open bottles. So there were like a couple of hundred bottles by the end of the night, because, you know, you're repping one of these brands. You've, you've, there's only so many open ones that you want in your house of the exact same bottle from your brand. So I kind of went home that night, you know, 20, like I said, 21, 22 with way more whiskey bottles than I had ever owned at a price point that I would never be able to afford at that time. Cause some of these were really, really high end stuff. And I sat down and me being the, you know, kind of nerd I am, I was like, okay, there's no way these are all the same. Like, there's no way that this is all tastes exactly the same and that there's something, there, there's something to it. There's a reason people fall in love with brands without even seeing the bottle, you know, with the, in the blind tastes and the, the blind testing. And so uh, I kind of just went down the rabbit hole. I started buying books. I started watching movies. I started to find any information I could to understand, like, what is the history of this product? You know, and like you said, the, the history of whiskey, the history of spirits, um, the history of these distilleries. And I, for me, it was really like an intellectual love. Like I fell in love intellectually with, for, uh, with it. And it, it kind of grew from there. No, so you dove in on the deep end yeah. right off the bat. It's yeah, got, yeah. I, I started like, backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when we started this podcast, I knew jet crap about whiskey other than I bought a few bottles. And then it was like, I got a little extra money. I'll just go buy everything I possibly can. <laughs> well, well, they actually, the whole thing really stems from there because they ruined me. Because now the first real whiskey I'd ever drank was way too expensive for me to go buy again. <laughs> so... Um, I had to figure out a way that, okay, how can I afford this whiskey? Cause now I can't go back to drinking that's, you know, bo bottom shelf stuff. Um, so that's originally what really brought me to the whole world of whiskey trading and arbitrage was I was like, okay, I can buy two bottles of this bourbon or this scotch in a liquor store in New York. And I can sell one of them to a guy in California for twice the price that I paid for this one in New York. And then I can get a bottle for free. And that worked out. And then, you know, so I did that at first. And, you know, it was a chance to, again, buy the whiskeys I was interested in and share them with friends. And then I was like, well, if I could buy two of them, then I could buy three of them. And then I can drink one, put one away. And so and it just kind of really exploded from there. Of like, okay. And then it got to the point of I'm like, wait, wait a second. Why am I able to buy this in New York and sell it for three times the price to a guy in California? I was like, Som something is wrong here if this is how it's working. Like, 
you know, you go online and you want to buy a pair of AirPods, you're like, okay, Best Buy has it for this price and Target has it for this price. And you're looking at five to 10, you know, $10 differences between these things. You go online and you start searching for, you know, wine and spirits and you're noticing hundreds, thousands of dollars, you know, in price discrepancies, in different states, different countries. And, uh, and that was really the second part um, of like, okay, something is up here. This is great. I, I, I've, I've, I'm all in. I love whiskey. I love the history. I love what they're doing. I love the flavor. Um, why is the sales and distribution so broken? So I, I think that gets into, to the next question, right? So as, as you get, you know, your experience with this, the next part is, is, is legality, right? Like we're not going to go into how, how whiskey is moved, but whiskey is moved in various channels, uh, <laughs> as other means of things like pickles and or hot sauce. Um, <laughs> But right, so you all are bringing some legality to the transfer and interaction of of these bottles, and you know, with you all being based in New York, I know it's it's getting a little better here in Kentucky. But like, what's it like to to receive a bottle uh, and go through that process? Like, how hard has it been from the legality standpoint, or have these new house bills, bills and regulations helped you all move whiskey around uh, the country and, and the world? Yeah, so it actually ties into your last question. This isn't just something that popped into my head overnight. Um, Baxis in, it, in its current form and, and in the way that it operates wouldn't have been possible uh, four or five years ago for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, technology, uh, you know, legality. And that was actually where I really, really cut my teeth over the past few years was understanding how certain auction houses are able to operate, how certain liquor stores, why certain states can ship to certain states and other states can't. I spent a really, really a tremendous amount of time doing a deep dive into the underlying laws um, to do exactly that, to be able to build a platform and a system that can take something that, you know, when we were talking about people getting scammed, it, they don't, they're they only getting scammed because there isn't, a, there isn't a more efficient way for them to do it compliantly. You know, if there were, like we said, if they were like, you know, quick, you go online and you were able to just buy or sell things that, you know, that were 100% authentic, then you wouldn't have to rely on these shadier marketplaces that people are, you know, with questionable characters. Um, and so that's really what it was, is actually figuring out how to structure it in such a way uh, that is, you know, makes it easy to use, but also legally compliant, because um, it, it works differently around the world. You know, in England, in the UK, I can I can buy a bottle of scotch and talk to my neighbor and he comes over and he's like, oh, I've been looking for that one. And he can hand me cash and I can hand him the bottle. And that entire transaction was totally fine. Um, in the US, technically, um, you know, if your neighbor's reimbursing you for the bottle that you bought for him, you know, when you went to to the liquor store, that's one thing. But if he's uh, paying you more for it, you know, that's that's the whole separate issue. In the US, they, each state is different. Each county sometimes has its own unique laws. So it gets gets more complex over here. Yeah, it's crazy that um, alcohol is that way, but in some states, most states, you can private transactions of firearms, and it's it's just crazy. But remnants of prohibition, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So we didn't we didn't get an amendment that uh, gave us the right to you know to booze, unfortunately. Yeah, it wasn't the it wasn't the first, second. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't one of the. No, that we, we we can change the Second Amendment to add alcohol, and life would be a lot a lot better. But anywho, um, <laughs> you know, so w w what I find interesting there, there's two things I find interesting. One is or thought provoking, not interesting. The two things I find thought provoking is one, what's the uptick in this? The second one is like, what type of rare bottles have you all seen kind of come through this process already? Sure. So to give it, just take it from the top, I, I realize I don't think I've explained to the audience yet. So Baxis, um, what we do at Baxis is we created a digital marketplace that uses blockchain to allow, and I know you guys have described, to allow people to buy and sell and trade uh, fine and rare spirits. So whether it's bottles or casks, that's the, you know, the overall idea. And um and you know, to dig in over there is in terms of what we've seen. So I mean, we've seen I mean, we've seen some crazy things, some really, really crazy bottles, because the first uh, users that we had that were dropping off bottles and depositing them were, you know, some big collectors, people who had had this stuff sitting in their basement for decades that, you know, some of them were, hey, I've got a spreadsheet of every single bottle I have over here. And some of them were, I bought these 25 years ago, I have no idea what they are. Uh, 
good luck. Um, and, you know, we'd go through them and we, again, scanned everything and took all the information and had to input that. So we've come across bottles that um, some of the distilleries didn't even know that had produced them, didn't even know existed. Um, because we were finding, I mean, really, really niche hole in the wall. You'd have to, you know, search a picture online to find that bottle featured in an advertisement that was advertising for a different bottle. You know, really, really some cool and interesting and unique things. Um, of course, once you get a bottle like that, you know, you really, really got to spend time on the authentication, make sure that this is real, that the tax strip is legitimate, you know, that the bottle hasn't been refilled, refilled, that it matches up with the existing photos that we know about it. Um, that, you know, and again, that's why we get the distilleries often involved and we, we work with them to be able to help on the authentication because the truth is they want to protect their brand also. They don't want someone out there marketing something as their juice that, that isn't. And then people get a false impression of, oh, this is, you know, this doesn't taste good. And it's like, well, that's because you're drinking $12, you know, bourbon poured into an $120 bottle. Um, so we we saw some, I mean, mostly what I think was was really cool from the bourbon and the and the old American. So um a bunch of the single barrel uh Stitzel Weller kind of uh, Julian Van Winkle, um, you know, his bottlings, those are those are pretty special. Like the stuff that he did at Old Commonwealth is really, really cool. You know, a lot of these things that that again, people didn't know they existed, but not because, you know. They only didn't know they existed because they were done for a private, you know, a private restaurant or for a bar or for somebody's, you know, somebody's uncle's retirement party. Um, and they called them up and they knew about Good Bourbon and they got these, you know, super private, you know, super private labels. Um, so those are really cool. I mean, that old, you know, those those old little like legendary pieces. But um, I also really love the old because it kind of shows you how far bourbon has come. Um, the really funky decanters. Um, whether it's the ceramics, you know, the old fitzes, the old beams, um, because it takes you to a time when you start to the binoculars, you know, you mm -hmm. look at them and you're like, why the hell are they putting in these packages like this? And then you have to go back and realize, well, there was a time when, you know, bourbon had really fallen out of favor. It was really, it wasn't the popular drink. It wasn't cool. And so these brands had to think of ways there, how do we make our, you know, packaging and our marketing seem more attractive so that people can differentiate us from another product. So one of the things that I, I enjoy about this. And again, as someone who knows this from a, from studying it, you know, it's not like I've been in this, you know, been into whiskey for about eight years, but it wasn't, you know, decades and decades, but people don't really know the cycle, like the history of how this has gone boom and bust, you know, multiple times in the past and how, you know, marketing really plays such a big role. So they all think that this is a new trend. Oh, they're just marketing to us. They're just trying to, you know, package it in something special and fancy and call it limited edition. And you look back to the 60s, you know, the bourbons from the 60s, they were doing the exact same thing because why were you going to buy one bottle over another? No, I, I think that's super interesting because I, I cracked open my great or my grandfather's uh, beam decanter from the 80s. And like, you would have never known. Like I, I saw that thing like, 500 times as a child and had no clue what it was. But like, as an adult, I'm like, Oh, that's really freaking cool. And then like you, you, you try the, the liquid and you're like, Oh man, it's really good. Um, and it's just really interesting. Uh, the story of, of bourbon because of that and like how they had to try to push it off because they had so much produced, uh, mm -hmm. in the eighties, uh, and they had to go overseas, Japan, like basically subsidized, the American spirit for years because no one here was drinking it. Cause they all drank vodka. That's crazy to me. That's, that's exactly it. And, um, and in that vein, one of the, one of the funny things that I learned and I, I won't say who, and I'm sure you guys know, but there are certain brands that, that from that time period that were exported to Japan and even sold locally that, um, that'll say 12 years on it or 16 years on it. And now we find out, oh, yeah, that's actually 23 or 24 year old juice. And for us, that's super exciting because you're like, oh, my God, that's crazy. Like, but, you know, the law only says that you can only put the, uh, you know, the age of the youngest. It doesn't doesn't stipulate that you have to put, you know, that you have to say how old it actually is, only that you can't lie and say that it's older than it is. And I asked the, you know, broker who had been producing it. And she goes, well, we were afraid that people would assume it's over oaked because no one was drinking 20 or 24 year old bourbon. So we marketed it as 12 and 16 year old because it was, even though it was actually 19, 20, 22, because we wanted to make sure people were buying it. And it turns out, you know, now these are the things that, that people would, uh, would kill for. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, 20, 20 year old whiskey is, is a something that you just have to try at least once. Like that's really kind of what you, you, you got to figure out and then you make your decision on if you like it from there. I think the oldest stuff I've, I've had is 18 year old 
well, I guess the beam stuff would be the oldest stuff I had since it was in the eighties, but you know, no telling how much oxidation and ceramic and, and all that kind of played into it. But the like newest open, you know, was that Elijah Craig 18. And so I think it's super interesting, uh, that a, uh, a flower brand, uh, you know, was, was so big and old, uh, sending some of their best stuff to Japan. Mm-hmm. So I guess let's talk kind of practically and, you know, say I uncover this really vintage old bottle in grandmother's basement. Uh, when she says, get all this stuff out of my house or whatever, you can go over and clear it out and you come across this bottle and look it up online. You figure out maybe it's got some value. Maybe it's thousand dollars, right? Mm-hmm. So where does that process start? If I want to sure. uh, reach out to you guys, just kind of get the process started. Yeah. So anyone can go to uh, www.baxus, B-A-X-U-S dot C-O, baxus.co. Um, that's our website. And, and you start from there. You just, you know, right now, I think it says uh, sign up for beta or express interest. And you type in your email and you get an email sent immediately to your account that you can click. And that, that sets up your account. So that, you know, gets you into our system so that, you know, like we said, the uh, the next edition is coming out over the next few weeks. It'll be pushed out. And basically, you'll be able to go in there and say, you know, submit inquiry. I'm looking to get in touch to buy a bottle. I'm looking to get in touch to sell a bottle. Um, and the reason why we have to do it that way is because, uh, like you had mentioned earlier, not every state has the exact same laws. So there are certain states where it's super simple. It's you have these bottles. Um, you tell us you want to get them to us. You either drive them to us if you're locally. You, uh, Depending on which state you're in, you can ship them to us. Um, we, you know, we have best recommended practices that re- we send people, you know, equipment if they need it, if they need to pack up, you know, if they're not familiar with it. Um, and then depending on the state, we'll also do pickups, you know, if it's a, if it's a large collection or we can aggregate a couple of collectors together, we'll actually send out a refrigerated truck, you know, to make sure that everything stays, you know, completely temperature controlled throughout the entire process, um, and make sure that they get delivered to one of our vaults, um, you know, strategically based on the location of the, uh, of the, uh, of the sellers. So, so that's the basic process is, you know, you sign up on the website, you get in touch and you say, I'm looking to sell my bottles. Um, what happens next is once those bottles hit our vaults, like we said, so we take them in and we scan them all and we scan them both as for two reasons. Well, it's part of the authentication process. You know, this is where our authenticators really, really are able to dig in. They're able to look at the bottle. They're able to look for defaults and flaws. But more importantly, we're able to actually store all those photos and images in a database that we are then able to use over time to expand our computer vision models, to be able to start to identify trends or flaws in bottles, both for, let's say, you know, just observational grading, like, hey, this one has a scratch in the label, you know, mark it down. But more importantly, for authentication purposes, that each photo is actually taken in a totally controlled and contained chamber. So the lighting conditions are always identical. So if we have 10,000 pictures of a bottle and then one of them comes in and the whiskey is way lighter, you know, then again, then the normal band and range from all those photos, we're like, okay, we have a problem here. There's a there's a flaw that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily catch us picking up and looking at a bottle, but when you're testing it against a database of thousands and thousands of photos of those bottles, um, it becomes easier for a computer to catch. So they come in, they get scanned, they get authenticated um, or rejected, you know, in the event that that they're not authentic or that they're, it's indeterminate, you know, we're, our whole thing is we're going to err on the side of caution. You know, we're, we're going to, you know, our goal is to make sure that anything that you're buying on our platform is secure, insured, and um, and authentic. That's really, you know, really, really the key goal. So if there's something that's questionable, we're just not going to be able to put it up because we, you know, it's not fair to that potential buyer down the road who, you know what, we uncover more information years later and somebody bought it from you and, you know, now they're the one stuck with it. So we we really want to make sure that everyone is having that seamless experience and buying, you know, buying the actual products that they're looking for. Um, so so the bottles go into our, uh, into our vaults, um, they're tokenized, and then your account is issued all of those tokens. So when you log into your Baxis.co account, You'll see your dashboard. Um, I'll pull it up for you guys later so I can show you. But you'll see your dashboard. You'll see all of your bottles in there. You'll see we we currently have the largest data set of historical spirits prices. So, I mean, going back, I think we have sales going back, like auction sales going back 60 or 70 years. So, I mean, as far back as we can find data from, scraping the entire internet, visiting all the auction sites, tracking down from retail sales. And the idea is that we don't we won't tell you what the price of a bottle is because that's for the market to decide. But what we show you is a graph, almost like a stock market. We show you every single trade that's happened with this bottle over the past however long of a timeline we have um, so that the market can determine how much they're willing to spend on these things. Um, And therefore, you 
see where it's priced at, and then you can go and you know set set the price at whatever you want, or not set a price. You know, keep it there just to collect and to look at. Um, you know, pull up the videos and and spin them around, show them to your friends. Uh, we worked with this company that does holograms. They've developed this like hologram system, and what's really cool is that our scans are so high resolution that they actually play really well in the holograms. They actually can appear. So we um, we did something with uh, Bardstown Bourbon when they released their uh, the Chateau Le Bode, the second the second edition. So uh, we were throwing an event. They you know and we we took one of our scans of it and just threw it up onto this hologram. And you had all of a sudden like this giant six foot bottle of Bardstown kind of floating around the room. And it was really cool. It was really really cool. Um, so yeah, so and that also again gives people who have you know are in the tech scene but have no idea you know they they don't know anything about whiskey or or you know any spirit really other than hey this is what I think I remember I drank in college or this is what some guy gave me at a bar they're now able to kind of dig into it and you know get a nerd out like I am and look into the metadata and see it was distilled in this year it was bottled in this year this was the you know all the background information that we can collect on it yeah. Um, yeah. So it comes in. Yeah. So basically comes into the platform and then uh, they're able to view it in their portfolio and then, you know, be able to set a price and, and list it for trading. Mm. So, so if I just want to be a, a curmudgeon, just sit on these bottles or these mm -hmm. tokens, I don't want to sell, but I sent you a hundred bottles. Mm -hmm. how, am I paying you a maintenance fee? Am I paying you an origination fee or like what, how does that work if sure. somebody's sending you bottles? So, so the off the bat, the way it works is there is a twenty dollar per bottle intake fee. So that's what we do for the scanning and for you know the authentication and that whole process. Included in that is two free years of storage and insurance. So for every bottle that you send us, if you want to leave it with us for two years, you don't want to list it, you sell it. You got two years where you know keep a clock on your account and you're you're good to go. Um, every time a bottle trades on our platform, we take a ten percent fee from the seller. So the seller pays 10%. So we've done a lot of modeling on that based on, you know, the current auction houses models and how much they charge. And we find that when the buyers don't have to pay a premium, they end up spending far more money on the bottles themselves because they don't have to start doing math in their head of what's 25% plus eight and a half percent. So they just start doing, you know, they spend more money, um, which means the sellers end up, even though they're paying a 10%, they end up netting out more money. Um, and at the same time, we're able to give them a global audience, which means that they're not just selling to, you know, the couple of local guys or, you know, the guys who log on at that specific time for an auction. You could just leave the bottle up for sale until somebody comes in and buys it. Um, so that's and then at the end of the two years um, right now, where we're currently looking to set it at is it's probably going to be charged at something like two percent per annum of the total bottle value. Um, and that's going to be based on the insurance, because that's roughly what we're paying for the insurance. And ultimately, mm -hmm. the idea being. We make our money off of the trading. We make our money off of you know the ability to to work with brands, to be able to sell and partner with them. Um, and pretty soon, we're also going to be making our money. We, you guys will get a little sneak peek, but we're actually working with several major banks and lenders um, to actually create loans that are backed by whiskey. Because if your bottles are authentic and they're temperature controlled and they're stored in a secure vault, and they've got value, you know. Why, you know, why wouldn't you be able to get a loan again? You can get a loan against your car that you might, you know, drive into a tree tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and, and, and total. Um, hey, knock on wood, I'm not going to do that. Well, hey, sorry, not you. A an individual might. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, or, you know, or or even, you know, houses when, uh, when you know, a bank gives a mortgage and then they have to foreclose and then they come in and the house has been totally wrecked on the inside. You know, they have to deal with all that and manage that. But as opposed to if if they're if the bank's collateral is locked up safe and they have you know x number of years of historical pricing data in the markets it actually becomes pretty easy for them to build a model um, a safe a safe model for them so that's something that we're going to be rolling out soon as well is hey some people might be storing their their whiskey with us not because they want to trade it um but because they you know they bought the bottles for a hundred dollars and they're trading for 1500 1600 and they're like hey you know what i want to renovate my kitchen and I can, instead of selling all of my whiskey that I have um, and, you know, hoping that, you know, and trying to buy it back in a couple of years, I can actually just take a loan against it like any other, you know, valuable asset I own. I want to make a clarifying point because sometimes in this day and age, because bottles are so rare to come by and some people have opened them and just sniffed them and make sure there's no cork taint, whatever. Are these only unopened bottles? Yes. They're only sealed bottles. Um, and again, because that's, that's really the only way that a we can really work on guaranteeing the authenticity, um, and b, yeah, and the integrity. So you know what I get it. People open them, they want to sniff it, they want to drink it, and 
it might still have some collectible value among your friends or people who know and trust you. But ultimately, we need this to work for someone who's never met you and has no idea who's on the other side of the trade. Mm. Um, because one of the important things is, again, it's all all of the trading happens on the blockchain. So it's all anonymized in terms of you don't know who you're buying or selling from. You might send your your uh, profile and your portfolio to your friend and say, hey, look at my collection. And then he'll know which account is yours, but you don't have to. Um, and in addition, and this is actually a really, really important point, even though we built everything on blockchain, so that means that the database structure is all blockchain, it's all public, it's how, it's how you can actually see how these bottles are trading, it's how we're hoping to prevent a lot of the shill bidding that happens when a lot of these new bottles come out. You know, there's a group of guys who start to drive the price up and make everyone think that there's a lot of demand, but it turns out it's actually just the same few people kind of running this scam. So the goal is that by putting this on a public ledger, we'll actually be able to track who's who's driving up the bids. So if you notice the same few accounts and the same few wallets, you know, over and over, you'll actually start to uncover a little bit of the shenanigans that have been going on in the, in the business. Mm. Um, but what's really important is that we built our model because we know that the average uh, whiskey and bourbon lover isn't necessarily, you know, a huge technology early adopter looking to understand crypto. And we also know that hey, you don't want to list a bottle for sale that you paid $100 for and listed in some digital currency that's $100 one day and then $5 the next day. And then, you know, you've, you know, somebody buys your bottle for, and you take a $95 loss. So one of the key things at Baxis is that you're actually, all of your transactions, your listing prices right now are listed in dollars. You, your account is paid out in dollars, but all of the transactions themselves take place using a digital dollar, the USDC, the stable coin, on the blockchain. So it's a way to make sure that, you know, everyone is, as at least in the US, obviously, as we go global, we'll look for, you know, other currencies and how to build in that form. But this way, everyone is buying and selling and listing in prices that they are very familiar with and that they don't have to, you know, we don't want people who love bourbon and who love whiskey to have to go learn an entirely new technology just to continue to do the thing that they love. Yeah, one bottle for 0.1 Bitcoin, <laughs> whatever. But exactly, because that could be, you know, Two hundred dollars one day and thirty five hundred dollars the next, and uh, and so we 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 spent a lot of time because that's another key differentiator. Most NFTs, almost all, are priced in you know whatever the cryptocurrency of the of the chain that they're on. Yeah, and yeah. that that works when you're dealing with something that has no physical mirror where there is no other way to buy this good. This doesn't exist in the real in the you know I'll say in the real world. It only exists on this blockchain. So. You can only use your that currency. Um, you know, if I've got a bottle listed and you know whatever I listed at, but it's trading at twenty five hundred dollars based on the cryptocurrency value, but you can go into your local liquor store and buy it for six hundred dollars. You're never going to buy it on. You know, you're never going to buy it to trade it. You're never going to buy it on the platform because, again, you have no idea how volatile it'll be. So that's that's been a really really big point for us is making sure that people still feel really really comfortable um, regardless of their you know technological uh, experience. Mm. And, and I would just add, like, you know, since we're, I know we're, we're a little bit in, but, you know, USD uh, can be staked in um, <clears throat> cryptocurrency. And that basically means you really can't touch it because uh, it's accruing interest. So if, if you're interested in this, make sure you're not staking your USD um, mm -hmm. so that you can make this transactional purchase. Uh, and that mm -hmm. is me knowing slightly nothing about crypto. Uh, for for everyone that that is listening, but like that's one thing I I did with Ethereum Classic, and I've done with uh, my USD that I that I own personally. I've staked it, so I can't really use mm -hmm. it transactionally. Right, exactly. That's kind of like putting it into again for an equivalent. It's not identical, but almost like putting it into a CD where it's locked for a couple of months. You get a little bit of interest on it, um, and again, but you, but there's risk to there's risk involved. Um, yeah, and, and this is a big part of it also, is that people who are looking to learn more and understand more about cryptocurrency um, and blockchain in general, um, we're going to be doing a lot of education around it because people are interested. They, you know, We built it out in a way that's easy for them, but there are people who are definitely going to say like, hey, I do want to learn about this. And if I can learn about it through whiskey and through this conduit of you know information that I happen to love and enjoy already, all, all the better. Um, and that's really, again, because whether it's whiskey education or technology education, like we, we understand that that really comes first to help, again, building a community. Now, is there a, a minimum dollar value on the bottles that you guys accept? So we haven't set one right now, um, primarily because the $20 intake fee kind of has, you know, we use that as a way to also mitigate an offset so we don't have endless shelves of, you know, cases and cases of your 
very standard product. Um, over time, we you know we may have to develop one, but right now, what we really want is to give people the opportunity to say, "Hey, you might have a bottle that you know, uh, I'll, like say for Maker's Mark, for example, people go and dip their own bottles at Maker's Mark, and that could have a lot of sentimental value to someone." So we don't want to deter them from being able to store that, you know, with us and be able to protect it. So, you know, I think a maker's bottle will cost you about 40 bucks or so. So you're paying 50% of the value up front, you know, for that storage mm-hmm. and authentication. But ultimately, and then over time, you know, that that 2% after two years. But ultimately, if you want to, quote unquote, bank it with us, we, we want to keep it protected. We want you to be able to enjoy that or appreciate that or let your great, great grandkids open it up one day. And then there's a retrieval fee for like if you do want to redeem or or get your bottle back. Exactly. There's a redemption yeah. fee also. Mm-hmm. So I guess one thing that kind of struck me as I was picking up one of these bottles I'm sipping from tonight is like single barrel like store picks or mm-hmm. club picks, you know, like Bourbon Lens has done picks. Mm-hmm. And right now they're, you know, on my top shelf and they're all displayed for, you know, the extra bottles. But like something like that might be something that somebody could just test this out with is, you know, a hundred dollar bottle of a store pick that they did and they, they were involved in the pick. Maybe that's where the sentimental value is a little bit higher. So they wouldn't mind. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And then on top of that, we're working with um, actually a bunch of brands to do their digital archives where they're going to send us one bottle of every bottle they produce. We're going to give them their scans and their tokens. So exactly like you described, having the extras kind of all lined up on your shelf, they're going to be able to have that entire database and be able to display that anywhere in the world of every single bottle in super high definition, high resolution, but almost like that seed bank that they have up in like the North Pole or something, you know, that underground vault that has like copies of every plant on, on planet Earth. They're also going to have a physical vault where, you know, we all know there are distillery robberies, there are distillery fires, there are floods. There's any number of things that unfortunately could go wrong at a distillery, but they know that they now have a redundancy. They have a full catalog of everything they produce, you know, tucked away somewhere safely so that they'll they'll have it in the future. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, like if you go to Buffalo Trace or Jim Beam, like you can go and sit there and, and you see the standard offerings, but like a, a Booker's 30th Rye. Like you don't want that just like chilling out and like something bad happened. Like uh, somebody walks by and like pokes it and it falls and it breaks and you're like, well, we don't have any more Booker's 30th rye anymore. It, it, exactly. That's 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 part of it is for the distilleries. And then, like you said, for the store picks, one thing that we're working with also for you know people who do individual barrel picks is um, because it's all on blockchain and everything can be recorded and attached. So you could actually sit down with the group of guys who did the pick and have them sit around and literally record a video of them each talking about the tasting notes or why they chose that specific barrel or you know what went into it that made it so special and you can store that video on on chain you know connect it to the nft and the metadata so that when somebody redeems that bottle in 10 years and taps the tag that we attach to it you know that that actually shows you and pulls up the proof of authenticity you'll also get the video of you guys sitting around and talking about it so it's not just the it's actually preserving that type of thing, you know, effectively in perpetuity, um, giving that real preservation of, of, you know, like we said, the craft and the, the heart and the love that went into into the production. Mm, that's um, very interesting. I mean, I know, I know it's been like six months since we we last spoke, and it was just at the Bourbon Festival. But mm-hmm. it seems like you guys have done a lot of branching out from what was even discussed back in September. Just, mm-hmm. I'm sure it was all like in process but now it's like okay now it's great to hear like we're also doing this we're also doing this but yep yep and uh and i mean then that's that's exactly it is there's i mean there's so much still on the plate that i you know i'd love to do and the team is like hey we we only have so many people and there's only so much we can do at once um but that's really what's exciting about what we're doing is that the technology keeps improving and keeps evolving and that we're able to kind of as new features come out on the technology we're able to say okay how can we use this to make the experience better how can we use this to help distilleries be more transparent so i mentioned like the temperature and the tracking so there's a distillery that's coming on board late this summer that's already working with us and we're going to announce a partnership where all of that temperature and humidity tracking technology that we have is going to go not only into their rick houses but into their still rooms into everything so that you're going to get total transparency on their entire whiskey making process and then total transparency on the aging process. So each barrel, each single barrel, when they eventually sell it in six or seven years, you're going to be able to scan the label and see whatever seven times 365 is of the exact of the temperature and humidity on each day that this barrel lived in the rickhouse. Hmm. You're going to get to see all of the information about it. And again, 
do we know that this data will end up revealing any significant insights? No, we, you know, we don't know yet, but could it? It absolutely could. It could be that while they're watching the maturation processes, they figure out what the sweet spots in their rickhouses are. You know, which, who's, which, which areas of the rickhouse based on temperature and humidity are producing their honey barrels and their unicorns. Yeah. Well, and you can, you can assume that it will. I mean, you, you look at somebody like an old forester who's already doing some heat cycling and putting temperature gauges in, in a variety of barrels, not all of theirs. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and you can see that they, they kind of know what's happening. Um, so the, the hypothesis is really cool that you're not only using this technology for the good of, of the consumer now from a collection and, and selling perspective, but also from, um, you know, the downstream effect of, you know, giving members that drink, I say members, but giving more people the opportunity to know the whole story because bourbon mm -hmm. today is still a cloudy industry. Um, and I think, any clarity, whether sourcing or, um, you know, where was it actually set? You know, like if it, if it is in Rick house, whatever, did it make it at this unique product? Did it make it, you know, I'm going to pick on Buffalo trace, but like, did it make it Blanton's like, cause it was in warehouse H, mm -hmm. you know, yes or no. I mean, or did it make it King of Kentucky because it was in warehouse K at, you know, Brown Foreman. So I, I think those things are really interesting. Yeah. And, and again, I think it'll also be fun for the, you know, for the nerds among us to, oh, you had barrel number 232. Well, I got barrel number this and let's compare, let's compare what the weather was like on that day of that crazy snowstorm, like inside the rickhouse, you know, because these were opposite ends of the rickhouse or two different rickhouses in two different counties or, um, you know, people have fun with it because, and ultimately that's, again, a lot of this is, like you said, is the transparency because so much of the I, I appreciate legend. I really do appreciate the legends that are associated with the whiskey, but there's a difference between like the legends and the mythology and like just the marketing. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, questionable things that are shared in the marketing materials to try and make things sound more appealing and more attractive. Um, and I think that being able to eradicate a lot of the, again, I won't call them lies, but a lot of the misstatements with a little bit more transparency will be overall very good for the industry, but also, letting people continue to preserve those legends. Like if there's, you know, some sort of mythology or background story as to how this was made or, you know, these happy accidents that, that, you know, keep coming out of these distilleries, like preserve that, preserve that. So it's not just like a story that people share around the table, but it's like, Hey, this is actually, it's recorded, you know, and it's recorded and stored on a blockchain. So it's there for forever. Yeah. There was, there was a short period of time where the distillery X did this and those bottles were going to be super special and, 15, 20 years. Well, if you have the data and the nerds are going to seek it out regardless. So, yeah. Um, but again, and this is, I think one of the biggest points ultimately is because of how we're doing this and, the, and our ambition and vision for how to do this globally, the goal is really to be able to then connect these whiskey lovers and these people with, with like-minded people around the world. Um, you know, so much of this is so localized. So, you know, it's, oh, I know these guys from my bourbon pick groups, or I know these guys from, you know, the the local meetups that we do, but it's like, okay, but what about the guys who really, really love the same things as you but live in Iceland that you have no idea who they are and you've never connected and you've never met? What about the, you know, the types of spirits that you might be interested in because you're only used to drinking bourbon, but it turns out you actually would love a good pot stilled Irish whiskey. Um, how do you connect with the brands and how do the brands connect with you? Um, and that's another thing is that, you know, regardless of obviously the three tier system and, and other things in the US, there's very limited ways for the brands to actually really interact with their real collectors, with the people who are really passionate about their brands. And what the platform now would allow them to do is in a totally anonymized way to go on and say, okay, account number one, two, three has every single release of the old Forrester birthday bird. Just throwing that out because I know you mentioned you were drinking it. Um, <laughs> We're, we're doing a new release or we're doing something special or we want to host a private dinner and invite the top collectors of this, you know, to that event and actually connect with the, not the distributor who bought it from them, not the liquor store who bought it from the distributor, not even the necessary, the first consumer who bought it from the liquor store, but the person who actually ends up buying them to sit on them, to collect them, to open them, to appreciate them. Um, that's really what it's about preserving. And, and it's the same thing also for the bottles people open. So when they actually redeem the, um, the bottles, right? So the, the NFT, the token leaves their wallet because they can't sell it again. They can't trade it again. You know, it's, it's out of the system. But 
when they actually open that bottle, they can still tag it and record it so that they can save their tasting notes to it. They can save their information. Like they still get that digital, you know, preservation. It sits in, in you know, a, a digital vault or where they can go back and look at here are all the bottles I opened. Here are the friends I opened them with. Here, here are the memories I created um, in a way that, you know, whiskey and spirits have done without a blockchain for so long. Um, you know, that's really people, people gather together to sit around the drink or a fire and, and talk and share stories. And, but it gives them a chance now to actually capture those, those moments in those, spe- you know, that, that the history. That's a very interesting point that probably a lot of people didn't think about, but just recording the memory, the data, the, you know, cause I've got tasting notes from hundreds and hundreds of bottles of whiskey that I've tasted, but do they mean anything? And they're just hand scrawled, but maybe in 30 years or 50 years, somebody's going to find those tasting notes or find that. And they're like, this guy had this whiskey at this time. you like, I mean, but now that, you know, everything's going digital. Mm-hmm. To actually have a, a place to digitize that and have that data. We all love data. We all love information. Everybody's always seeking more and more and more information. So that's a good point. Data is yeah. king. Data data is king uh, in this day and age, right? Yeah. And and I mean, we're definitely seeing that. I think we're seeing it on the brand side also. They, you know, they're constantly talking about data and trying to be more transparent in the ways that they can, you know, re- being more specific when they reveal their mash bills. Uh, some distilleries obviously better than others or when they reveal what goes into their blends. Um, but yeah, but ultimately that's that's really, at the end of the day, this is something that we still hope people are opening and enjoying. It's not just about the collection. It's not just about the chase and the hunt, but hey, we love that too. Like we all, we, we I appreciate the thrill. I've done it. I love it. Um, but ultimately the, the best feeling is sitting around with someone and then going, do you remember that time we cracked open that, you know, limited edition, super rare bottle that we're never going to find again, but, you know, I drank it with you. We had a chance to sit down and do that. That's, those are special. And that's, uh, that's something that, that, you know, people, like we said, people, people have held on to for a very long time, but if you could eventually start to aggregate that data, like, Hey, you know what, we might discover something about your palate just from the different data that we collect about the different whiskeys that you've rated a certain way or certain flavor profiles that you've picked up that might connect you again with someone else who's like, hey, I'm finding identical notes. If you liked a whiskey and we have similar taste, you know, palettes, I'm most likely going to like that whiskey too. So you end up with referral data, recommendation data, and, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, opening that that world of whiskey uh, and spirits beyond just, you know, what people are comfortable with. Yeah. So as, as we lane the... La- as we land the plane tonight, you know, I, I think we're at a place in a, in a crossroads in the whiskey industry because we, we we talked about bourbon primarily because that's what we talk about. But this this goes far past bourbon and into whiskey in general and, and other spirits. You know, my, my last question I have for you, and I don't know what Scott has, but like forecast me five years from now, like where do you think we are in – the realm of the impossible today that will be possible in the next five years and, and what this market landscape could be? That's a great question. Um, got me thinking. I like it. So, I mean, one of the general trends that I think we're going to see in the next five years is a lot more transparency. I think that once certain brands are show that it's possible to do, consumers are going to start to expect and demand it. Um, they're really gonna, you know, they're really going to say like, Hey, if you can tell me how old this stuff is, and we know you can, like, we want to know how old, it, how old it is. We're still buying it, but we want to know that because, you know, then we can understand to see if it's justifiable what your price point is. Um, something that I think also is going to really change the market is, um, cask trading data is going to become increasingly more transparent, both on our platform and in general, which means that people are going to have a much better idea of how much that bottle of that single barrel should cost. And it'll surprise them in both directions. Um, Cause I think a lot of people are like, Oh yeah, it was probably X, you know, it was probably tens of thousands of dollars. And that's why I have to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for the single barrel. Um, and sometimes they are, but you're, but what you're really going to find, I think more often is, Hey, these guys are making quite a handsome premium on this particular thing. And what makes it different from any other barrel that had the exact same mash bill that came out of the same distillery. So I think we're going to see a much more educated consumer, um, which I think is a good thing because it's going to force those brands to 
to really revisit how they how they try and target consumers, you know, beating them with quality and with with real relationship and connection. You know, people who build an affinity for a brand buy that brand. So I think it's going to put it onto those brands to say, hey, we want to we want to build that relationship with you um, in a way that they haven't really felt compelled to up until now because you know they're the hottest thing in town. Everyone wants them. They don't have to you know they don't have to try and reach out and and find anyone and. Um, I think just one other trend that I'm seeing now that I I don't know how to place and I don't know how it'll go, but I've been noticing increasingly this kind of like that Gen Z has a a very different relationship and perspective of alcohol than I think like millennials and previous generations. So I think that's going to be just a really interesting space to watch because, you know, if you were to look at the trajectory of whiskey and just general alcohol consumption for the past few years, like it's it's trending way up, which explains why we're seeing tremendous investment in massive new distilleries and massive increases in production and and rick houses to store all the barrels but um you know things cycle things change you know like you were discussing during the the vodka boom where whiskey sales started to dwindle um so who knows so i don't i don't know it might be that we notice that there's a massive massive increase in the lower alcohol rtd space and therefore a ton of these barrels that are sitting there aging are just going to get turned into highballs or canned old fashions or canned manhattans or other types of cocktails um, and it might be that, you know, this, the Gen Z trend reverses and that they actually end up, you know, as they get older, they gain a more of an appreciation for some of these things. Um, but what I, what I'd imagine, and again, these are people who have more data than I do and are, are uh, you know, this is their life uh, based on the amount of money that we're seeing come from these distilleries and these ma- major, major brands. Um, I believe that they're forecasting a significant increase in demand on a global level, because I think that's one other really important thing to think about is. Urban, uh, in particular, let's say, has really not made its way into India and China. And you're sitting on two plus billion people over there. So when you think about how how little bourbon there is to meet the U.S. demand and, and the global demand, and then you think about, hey, there's two billion people out there who haven't even touched the stuff yet. Um, who knows? We, we could be seeing that that's really it. Like similar to how Japan was in the uh, in the 80s, we could be seeing that coming out of uh, India and China over the next few decades. Man, we could have like, six or eight podcasts just on predictions like that i mean that's it's pretty fascinating but we're definitely in an interesting time and the uh the in the interest in whiskey is is definitely just skyrocketing obviously it's just continuing up but but what your comment was about like gen z and the reduced intake of of whiskey it's an interesting component. So maybe it it might even force some of these four or five, eight, ten year old whiskeys to become twenty year old whiskeys and all these whiskey collectors and enthusiasts like us that we might be sitting on some twenty year old cast releases in a few years. A hundred percent. And that's uh it's one of the nice things that I love about whiskey. And obviously with with bourbon, there's some increased risks of that oakiness just because of the climate. But one of the nice things, you know, about scotch is um, you can just keep aging it, you know, over there, especially because they have a much you know different climate and different uh, different angel share. So, in a quote unquote worst case scenario, you know, the whiskey market cools off for three to five years. Well, you have whiskey that's three to five years older when you finally do put it into a bottle. So, um, it's one of the nice things about you know getting into this hobby versus you know if you're a car, you know, if you're buying new cars, and I think uh, you know if you look down, where is it? Uh, somewhere in Kentucky now with all the unfinished uh, pickup trucks from Ford because they're missing chips, like. Yeah, they're they're starting to move some of them out at Kentucky Speedway. Oh well, a bunch a bunch of them got in trouble because uh, rats went in there and ate the wiring. That that's what I'm talking about. So that's stuff that you can't just leave it sitting there and say, you know what, this 2022 is going to sell like crazy in 2023 because it's a year older as a car. But uh, you know what, if there was if those were Rick houses full of bourbon, people would appreciate that they were sitting there for the extra time. Or you get the 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 Tesla version of 2023. You could have bought it December 31st. The same exact car, and then two weeks later, it's worth twenty percent less. And I raised my hand because that happened to me. Oh well, I am sorry to hear that. I I guess I got lucky that they never actually released the Cybertruck. I'm I'm still waiting on that one. (laughs) Well, there you go. Uh, We we all can't be as lucky as as you. Um, (laughs) When was the Terminator? What what was the date of the Terminator movies? (laughs) That's when that will come out. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, no, hey, but, but 
but Todd, this is, this has been great, like conversation and super interesting. We'll, we'll definitely have to have you back, like probably on an annual basis, just to, you know, connect with you. But, you know, for our listeners, if you don't mind just sharing again, how they can get connected with you all, um, virtually, cause that's where, where you all are, how, how they can get connected and, and start, you know, engaging in this exchange opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the best way to connect, of course, is to go to our website and to put in your email. That's uh, www.baxus.co, um, baxus.co. Um, you'll be able to find us there. And uh, the second best way, I would say, is to follow us on Twitter at baxusco. So at baxusco on Twitter. Um, we tweet about whiskey. We tweet about interesting trends in the technology space. Um, we, you know, and, and ultimately, like I said, we're looking to build a community. We want people who are interested, um, plenty of naysayers, but we're happy to talk to them too. Cause what I tend to find at least is the people who are the most skeptical of the NFTs at least still care about the whiskey. And, and to me, that's just as important. You know, you get to have a conversation about the whiskey and explain to them why the technology isn't as uh, demonic as they think it is. Um, cause listen, I'm a big believer that you can't drink a picture, but you know what? You it's a lot harder to trade a bottle that's sitting in somebody's basement to believe it's real. So we're trying to bridge those gaps in a way that that you know at least the technology is allowing. No, that that's super interesting, and we we just followed you all just to make sure we're joining the conversation. Uh, we like to do things in real time here on on the Bourbon Lens Podcast. So uh, we we truly appreciate the not only the the lesson in crypto and, and NFTs, but just the conversation about the evolution of buying and trading whiskey uh, and making it legal, I think is, is the most important thing uh, for the end consumer and for the seller um, so that they're not getting in trouble. Like we saw a few years with, uh, you know, them shutting down all the Facebook groups and, and you know, causing a ruckus. So Todd, we, we, we truly appreciate you joining this episode of the Bourbon Lens. And to everyone who listened to this episode, we truly appreciate you listening. Uh, if you're so inclined, please go to your favorite podcast listening app and give us a five-star review and drop us a comment. We truly appreciate it. And if you want to join our conversation, you can go to Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bourbon Lens. And last but not least, if you want to be part of our growing community, go over to patreon.com backslash Bourbon Lens and join our community where we have exclusive opportunities to get in you know, conversations with these distillers and, and these people that are, are making the trends in the whiskey industry. We truly appreciate it if you joined us there. And until next time, cheers. 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 Have a great night.